Right. Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2022 edition of the Schubert Seminar. Uh, our first speaker for 2022 is Alan Knudsen from Cornell, and he's going to tell us about the committing variety and generic fibrings. So take it away, Alan. Thanks for having me. So <clears throat> uh, I'm starting off with a non Schuberty thing, which is the space of pairs of commuting matrices. So uh, if I tell you I'm thinking about pairs of matrices and, uh, and I'm imposing these n squared many quadratic equations that say, the matrix entries of xy, this homogeneous quadratic and the xy entries, equals the corresponding matrix entry in yx. Does that ideal, uh, is that ideal radical that's generated by those n squared many equations? So if it's not, it means that there's somehow secret equations that are also true on the set of pairs of commuting matrices that, that hold for any pair of X and Y of complex matrices that commute, but that you can't directly derive from those quadratic equations. And that might sound crazy, but let's start with a simpler example. What if I told you about matrices that square to zero? And you say, well, matrices who square to zero are nilpotent. If they're nilpotent, all the eigenvalues are zero. If the eigenvalues are zero, then the trace is zero. And in the process of saying such things, you've derived this linear equation, trace of m equals zero, you've derived it, derived it from these homogeneous quadratic equations. And that's not possible without taking a square root somewhere. And you really notice it if you think about the one by one case, where I tell you I've got a number whose square is zero, can you derive from that that the number is zero? And if it's a complex number, sure. But if you're trying to do algebraic geometry where you might be running into nilpotence and stuff, then you're not supposed to be able to derive that directly. So nobody knows whether uh, there are secret equations on the space of pairs of commuting matrices. Uh, you can check it for small sizes, like uh, up to four by four easily enough, um, using, um, uh, you, you can say, uh, does I uh, double equal radical of I in Macaulay two, and find out that, uh, that it's fine, there aren't secret equations, but that doesn't tell you for all n by n. So I was uh, brought to, this question was brought to my attention uh, like 15 years ago, a um, little bit more. And I, <clears throat> um, and I said, well, I have some tricks that might be able to get a hold of this. So the usual trick people think about is to say, we have a GLN action on this space. We could conjugate X to be in uh, Jordan canonical form. And then why commutes with that? Does that help us? Well, it's pretty gross figuring out what commutes with somebody in Jordan canonical form. But even if you did that, you'd still somehow be thinking about the set of pairs, not thinking about the ideals. Anyway, so I said, let's degenerate this guy. Let's take these quadratic equations and degenerate them, maybe not all the way to monomial equations, but to something simpler. And so, I said, let's introduce this diagonal matrix. It's got powers of t down the diagonal. And I'm going to use the, um, this linear change of coordinates where I take my matrix x and I'm right multiply by the diagonal matrix and my matrix y and I left multiply by the inverse. And then instead of the equation xy equals yx, I get this equation here, x prime y prime, it's not equal to y prime x prime on the nose, it's that conjugated by this diagonal matrix. So for any non-zero value of t, I've got this scheme here, which is isomorphic to the original commuting scheme, isomorphic by this stupid linear change of variables. And I uh, had at this point gotten used to, uh, as I say, this was 15, 20 years ago, gotten used to thinking about the limit as t goes to zero and see what happens to the equation and hopefully see what happens to the scheme. Now, you can't just say the limit of the equations will define the limit scheme. Uh, this is a Grubner basis uh, statement you're making. It's like, if I have two planes and they intersect on a line and I take the limit of those planes and they fall on top of each other, then the limiting planes don't intersect in the limiting line. They intersect in a plane. So I'm not guaranteeing that I'm not making any claim right now that when I take the limit of these n squared many quadratic equations, the limit is t goes to zero here. I'm not claiming that I'm necessarily getting 
the actual limit of the commuting scheme. I might be getting something accidentally bigger, like this limiting plane is not the right thing. It contains the limiting line. So nonetheless, let's take the limit of those equations. So there's n squared many equations going on here. And n of them are really easy. The, if you consider, if you compare the diagonal of this guy to the diagonal of that guy, then they're equal on the nose, that conjugating by a diagonal matrix doesn't do anything to the diagonals. So that's what I have over here. And if you think about um, what conjugating by this diagonal matrix with powers of t does in general, it introduces positive powers of t in one triangle of y prime x prime and negative powers in the other triangle. So, uh, and it depends, the, the actual power is t to the i minus j. It depends on which diagonal you're in. So down the main diagonal, it's zero, like I was saying, but in general, you get positive powers in one triangle, negative powers in the other. So where you've got positive powers and you let t go to zero, then that's easy. You're, uh, that, that entry vanishes. And instead of saying that a matrix entry of this equals a matrix entry of that, you get a matrix entry of this is zero. So that's what's going on here. But where you have a negative power of t, you might worry your equation's blowing up as t goes to zero. That's fine. You multiply through by the right power of t. And instead of having a negative power of t on one side, you've got a positive power of t on the other side. And you take the limit and you get these other equations. And so I, studied, I st st stared at these equations, these n squared many new quadratic equations for a while, and noticed that these last ones are almost implied by the previous ones. Because uh, I'm going to stop saying prime all the time. We'll just call them x and y. If you have x, y lower triangular and y, x upper triangular, well, you know those two matrices have the same characteristic polynomial because that's obvious when x is invertible because then they're conjugate to each other. And then by continuity, it's always true. So that means that the eigenvalues of x, y and the, uh, the y, x are the same but you can see their eigenvalues. They're on the diagonals because these are triangular matrices. So I know that the diagonal of xy is some permutation of the diagonal of yx. All I'm doing here is being specific about which permutation it is. So, so then I thought, well, okay, what if we leave those out? And I got this thing that I um, introduced in this, uh, in this paper, um, some schemes related to the uh, commuting scheme. Um, called, uh, that I called the lower upper scheme. And I mean, in that paper, I changed pretty quickly to the upper upper scheme, which I thought was more convenient, but uh, actually I, I'm, these days I like the lower upper scheme more. It's not, again, not, a, not an interesting difference, just a linear change of variable. So this is pairs of matrices where I only imposed the first two groups of equations. I didn't say anything about how the diagonals relate. And this doesn't have the GLN action we had before. So remember I said, you can conjugate x, you can conjugate x and y simultaneously by an element of GLN, and they'll still commute or not. And here you can't do that, but there is an action of this group, which is worse than GLN because it's solvable, but better than GLN because it's bigger. It's actually got twice the dimension of torus in it than GLN has. So uh, the action is very simple. I've multiply x on the left and right by my lower and upper triangular matrices and y on the right and left by their inverses. And if you, multi if you multiply through, you'll get like b minus x, y, b minus inverse. And you see that that is keeping x, y lower triangular like it's supposed to be. So that's why I have this group action. And you can blame this group action on the original GLN that as we're degenerating the scheme, we're also degenerating the group. And actually, that's not quite fair because this guy's better than just the, de the degenerate GLN. Uh, you get more group invariance once you're finished degenerating. So anyway, I've got this. And what's particularly nice about this better action in some sense is that I can now take X and not just put it in Jordan canonical form, I can reduce it to a partial permutation matrix. So if it were invertible, you'd say this is the Bruja decomposition. So I was doing something like the Bruja decomposition on matrices instead of on invertible matrices. So if X were invertible, I'd reduce it to a permutation matrix. Of course, that would require K equals N, and I have examples where K isn't N, so I wanted to say it in this generality. 
But uh, anyway, that lets me reduce X to finitely many possibilities. So that's definitely better than the Jordan canonical form story where I have you know, continuously many different Jordan canonical forms. And then for each of those finitely many, you can say, what are the Y's that are lower upper with, with them? And I use that to index the components of the lower upper scheme and say, for example, when K equals N, that they are exactly indexed by those permutations I spoke of before. So this question, so let me say it this way. If you take this scheme, uh, sorry, uh, if you take the scheme, you leave these equations out. So it's now the um, lower upper scheme, I guess this scheme here. Uh, and you ask not just um, that the diagonal of XY is some permutation of diagonal YX. Let's ask instead just the diagonal of XY has no repeats. Uh, and so for K less than N, I guess that could happen. Uh, XY has no repeats. Then uh, that defines an open set. And what I'm telling you is that that open set is dense. So that open set is disconnected. It has one component for every way of matching up the K uh, matri uh, diagonal entries of XY with some of the N diagonal entries of YX. All the ones you don't match to will be zero. And those uh, are how you index the components of the lower upper scheme. So uh, the other thing I proved about this, other than thinking about its components, I proved in the square case that it's a complete intersection. So it's defined by uh, it's defined by not n squared equations anymore, only n squared minus n. But those are um, dimensionally independent. Let's say they cut the dimension down from two n squared where we started when k equals n, or two n k. They cut the dimension down from two n k. They cut it down to uh, um, to the expected dimension. So um, back to k equals n, they cut it down from dimension 2n squared to n squared plus n. And I want to point out that here we started with 2n squared dimensions, and we imposed n squared equations, and naively say we get something n squared dimensional, but we don't. We get something n squared plus n dimensional. Uh, sort of obvious, you think x could be diagonal, y could be another diagonal, that's 2n right there. Hit them with an element of gln. Um, module of the diagonals adds another n squared minus n, total of n squared plus n. So this guy is not a complete intersection. But once you leave out those diagonal equations, then you do get a complete intersection. And complete intersections are really easy to think about from lots of points of view. One thing I get from them in particular is that the degree of a complete intersection uh, by Bazou's theorem is just the product of the degrees of the defining equations. So I've got n squared minus n, many defining equations. Uh, each of them is quadratic. So there's the degree. And that's the sum of the degrees of the components. So I was in this weird position at this point in this paper from a long time ago, where I didn't know how to compute these individually. I only knew that each of them is some natural number, positive number. And when I add them all together, that I do know how to compute. So there's a one case that's really easy um, which is what if X has what if X is supported in the Northwest Triangle the, um, and Y is supported in the Southeast Triangle? That's linear equations. I'm telling you, vanishing uh, entries of X and Y, and that gives you uh, kind of the dumbest component of this guy. And linear equations means that the degree of that guy is one, and that corresponds to the permutation where. Uh, the diagonal of xy is the reverse of the diagonal of yx. So the easiest case is the one that's maximally far away from the interesting case. So as you know, it, as it always works out, right? But, uh, um, but I have this thing where I've got an easy case with a one, and I have the hard case that I want, and I have all these other guys, and I add them together, and I get 2n squared minus n. Two to the, sorry. All right, um, now for something completely different. Let's consider this Markov chain uh, with, based on the number n. So I've got this natural number n. Uh, the Markov chain has states that are complete matchings of the number one through two n. So that's what these three pictures are. I've, uh, I've got a teeny little one, two, three, four around the boundary of this. 
And in this case, one is matched to two versus matched to three versus matched to four. So it's easy to count these complete matchings. There's two n minus one double factorial of them. And uh, those are gonna be the states of this Markov chain invented by De Heer and Nienhaus. So uh, these are uh, mathematical physicists and they say, let's have these transitions where we spin this wheel of fortune. It goes around and around and around, and maybe it stops here between the one and the two. And having spun the wheel of fortune, we then flip this unfair coin. So it's not a heads and tails coin, it's an E and an F coin. And what's very important for me is that it's unfair, that E comes up two thirds of the time, F comes up one third of the time. And what I do when I, after I flip this coin, is if, I, if it comes up E, then I create a tiny little arch connecting positions I and I plus one. Now those two guys, so in this case, if I connect one and two, well, they're already connected, nothing happens. So you'll see there's a little self loop here labeled E1. If I were here and I connected one and two, I would get over to there. Because whoever these guys one and two were connected to, I'll just connect them to each other. So, uh, so if E comes up, I connect, um, I connect I to I plus one and whoever they were connected to, they get connected to each other. Um, uh, F, I instead um, flip who they're connected to. So instead of, uh, like in this case, instead of two being connected to two and uh, being connected to one and three connected to four, I would connect two to four and three to one. So if my, wheel came to here and I got the F, then it would jump me over to there. So that's what this F2 is. So that's the, that's the process, the, uh, the Markov chain. And it should be pretty intuitive that this guy in the middle is the least likely possibility. Even for general N, the matching where everybody is matched directly across, that's the least likely possibility. So I'm not going to prove that right now, but uh, just to try to be convincing, um, two thirds of the time you, you spin the wheel, you're going to be creating one of these little arches connecting an I and an I plus one. And if you then, so people are gonna typically be connected to things very nearby them. But if you then say, no, they are supposed to be connected maximally far away, you've got a very long drunkard's walk just going through the Fs to try to fix having done an E even once. So. De Heer and Nienhaus, and uh, separately uh, Zuzestan and um, uh, Di Francesco, uh, conjectured about this Markov chain. They conjectured uh, several things. One is that this is least likely. And when you take the ratio of anybody else's probability to this least likely probability, you get an integer. So in this tiny case, n equals two, uh, the integers are three and one and three. So these numbers down here, that's the stationary distribution of this Markov chain. If you do this thing a billion times, you'll be in here one seventh of the time and in each of those three sevenths of the time. So they conjecture that this relative, this ratio of the probabilities will be a natural number. And that's totally not true if you use a fair coin, by the way, you get totally gross numbers. So it's very special to use the two thirds, one third, um, eventually, one blames it on the Yang-Baxter equation. I'm, uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, how that works. There is another case you could think about where E comes up all the time. And what happens is very shortly, you never visit these cases where there's a crossing again. You only visit cases where you've got non-crossing chord diagrams. And then instead of 2n minus y double factorial, you end up with only uh, Catalan many states that you're actually wandering through. And I'm not going to talk about that one today either. So they, they compute these numbers. And these numbers are easy to compute by computer for, um, for reasonable size n. They, I think they went up from 1 to 8, computing all of these integers. And then they, uh, they said, let's focus attention not on this case, because that's too dumb. That's the least case. Let's focus attention on this case where the left guys connect directly to the right guys. So, um, so here I got three. If we, um, 
uh, if you ask for each size n, you um, you connect the left guys directly across to the right, and you say what's the what's the relative probability of that one? Then you get the sequence of numbers one, three, thirty one, eleven, forty five, uh, and so on. They plugged that into the OEIS, and and so the OEIS said those are the degrees of the first four commuting varieties. And the next four numbers that you mentioned, um, uh, I don't recognize them. So they, they put in a sequence of length eight and the OEIS recognized the first four. And so then they, uh, in the OEIS, it said the degree of this fourth guy, 1145, uh, that was computed by Nolan Wallach in 1993 by lashing the 10 spark stations together. And so they contact Nolan Wallach and he says, I have no idea how these things are connected, um, but I did just see this talk by Alan Knudsen on the commuting variety. So then they go to my paper and based on finding these numbers in my paper, so remember I was computing the degrees of these E pi's for small n, they came up with a more general conjecture that if you have a, so this is what number two here, if you have a chord diagram that's not just connecting, you know, your two end guys to each other any old way, but it connects the left end guys to the right end guys in some permutation. So there's n factorial of these bipartite chord diagrams where the left side connects to the right side. Those n factorial, uh, they, the probabilities that they're getting um, match the degrees of my varieties, my lower upper varieties. So, uh, so then they contact me and say, yeah, we, uh, we found these numbers in your paper. So uh, what's going on with that? And <clears throat> so it took a, a couple of years for, uh, for me and one of those four guys, Paul Zunjustan, to uh, prove these conjectures and also generalize them in a way I'm not gonna talk about today uh, to handle uh, general chord diagrams. So you need something bigger than the lower upper scheme. You need something that has a component, not just for every permutation like the lower upper scheme has, but for every perfect matching. And um, <clears throat> and Zuzhastan and I invented such a thing um, uh, and uh, show that the degrees of its components compute these things in general. Uh, mm, I guess there'd be a question in chat if people were ready to ask questions now, but I'll try anyway. We're good, there are no questions. All right. So um, here's just a bunch of stuff about degrees. Uh, <clears throat> maybe, so this, this, uh, this slide came from a um, a talk I gave um, uh, partly in a colloquium. And so uh, I wanted to be colloquial about degrees. And I'll mention several ways to think about degrees that probably uh, most people here know, but just in case. So if I have, uh, people usually talk about the degree of a projective variety, but I'm gonna think about its affine cone. So I'll have <clears throat> X, the affine cone over some projective variety defined by some homogeneous polynomials. And then you could either take that guy and intersect it with a complementary plane, count points. You could intersect it with a unit sphere and measure the volume of that with respect to some Hermitian metric on your uh, vector space. Well, what if you used a different Hermitian metric? Well, that's okay because you're normalizing it. Uh, this is about taking the leading term of the Hilbert polynomial. Um, then there's the first of two cohomology ways. You say, well, I'll projectivize, and that's defining an element in the ordinary cohomology of projective space. And the cohomology groups of projective space are one dimensional. So it's defining some number times the generator of that cohomology group, and that number is the degree. And the way I'm actually going to want to deal with it most often is in equivariant cohomology. So I said this guy was invariant under scaling, that it's, it's a cone, it's defined by homogeneous equations. And so I'll think that it's defining then an element in the equivariant cohomology of the vector space. And the equivariant cohomology of vector space is just a polynomial ring in one variable. So it's coming in in a certain degree of that 
polynomial. So I look at the coefficient, which also unfortunately is called the degree. So the degree of this, the degree of this polynomial here is n minus k, and its coefficient is the degree of x. So I've got various degeneration ways that I'm going to want to use to compute these degrees. And, and eventually I'll be computing not just degrees, but equivariant cohomology classes, but that was a, a less colloquial thing to talk about. So I mostly focused on the degrees. So I'm going to split the ambient vector space into a hyperplane and a line. So that's, I hope, easy to picture. I've got a hyperplane and a line. And X is neither the hyperplane nor the line. It's some curvy thing sitting in that ambient space, might intersect the hyperplane somewhere. And there's two uh, limits I could perform on X that will get me other schemes to think about and <clears throat> uh, that will have the same degree as X itself does. So one is that I scale the line down. So that's what's going on here in uh, taking X and scaling. So what Z is doing, it's only acting as written here, it's only acting on the L coordinate. It leaves the, it leaves the hyperplane alone, it shrinks the L coordinate, and I take the limit. So this is something like a slow motion projection of X into that hyperplane. And any single point of big X will indeed fall into that hyperplane when you hit it with, uh, with Z. All you're doing is projecting it and losing the coordinate you had on L. So that's what happens to the points individually in X, but that's not what happens to the limit of the scheme X. So dumbest case, what if X were all of V? So if you think about taking big V and you scale it, nothing changes. It's for every value of Z, you're just getting big V. So I got big V, big V, big V, and I take the limit, it's big V. So you can definitely get plenty of stuff that isn't in the hyperplane just because it's sort of, you're pulling stuff in from infinity and there's always more out there to be pulled in. So that's one, um, uh, one kind of degeneration. And if you think about what that degeneration is doing on the level of algebra, it's, uh, it's lexicographic. So it's taking the generators of the ideal for X and looking for the highest power of L on them. And you might think, well, that's weird. I'm, this is going to zero. Why am I looking at the highest power? And it's because acting on the space is dual to acting on its coordinate ring. So the other limit is you take Z to infinity. This one's actually simpler. I'm scaling away from H, okay? So if I start with, for example, imagine I have a circle in the plane and I'm going to scale the x-axis out. So I, what will happen is my circle will become an ellipse and in the limit, it'll become two horizontal lines. And so how do you think about that? You say, well, take the circle, intersect it with the hyperplane, you get two points. Then those are not going anywhere. Take them and cross them with the line. That's what you get in the limit. So that's not exactly, you know, that doesn't, that's not exactly true if your X prime lives in the hyperplane to begin with or has components that live in the hyperplane to begin with. But, um, uh, but generically, that's how you should think of what happens when you, when you stretch out. So, and on the algebra side, it's looking for the lowest power of, uh, um, of this variable L. So these two are actually related to one another, these two operations, and I'm, uh, <clears throat> they're projective dual. So what's projective duality about? We start with a variety X inside V, like I was doing, and then we define this guy CX called the conormal variety to X. So what it is, it's pairs of a point in V and a point in V dual, because that's where it lives, where V is a smooth point in X. So you could worry about what's happening at the singularities, and we're just going to punt that by avoiding them and taking a closure later. Oops, this closure here. So I take smooth points in X. I consider the, um, I consider the hyperplanes uh, in V that are, uh, that are tangent to those smooth points. So it contain the tangent space to, um, to the point V. And speaking dually, I think that um, I'm thinking about vectors in V dual that are perpendicular to the tangent space. 
So this guy lives inside V cross V dual. And if you think about V cross V dual as the cotangent bundle to V, then this guy is naturally, the cotangent bundle is naturally symplectic. And this guy will be Lagrangian inside there. So in the 19th century, I don't think they were thinking about that so much, but, uh, <clears throat> but they did observe that you can start with X inside V, make this guy CX inside V cross V dual, and then project to V dual, and you'll get something we'll call the projective dual cone. And, the fun, and it's dual in the sense that if you repeat this process, you get back to where you started. And there's, it's absolutely terrible trying to relate things about X to things about X perp. Um, <clears throat> uh, like the dimensions, there's, a, um, there's, there's no relating the dimensions of the two. Or if X contains Y, then X perp doesn't contain Y perp. There's no, uh, it's, it, it's a very tricky business. But uh, if we've split V into H cross L, we'll therefore split V dual into H dual cross L dual. And scaling L down is like scaling L dual up. So these two notions are projective dual in that sense. If you think about moving X by, um, don't take the limit yet, but just move X using, um, uh, using Z, then you'll be correspondingly moving X perp using Z inverse. And so the, <clears throat> the Lex limit of one relates to the Rev Lex limit of the other. And pretty soon I'm gonna be using um, both, to, and I'll be mixing the two of these together. Okay. So what I want to compute is the degrees of the e pi. So remember back in the, the De Heer Nienhaus story, the degrees of the e pi were relevant for computing the, um, the probabilities that you're in one of these states. So I want a formula for the degrees of the e pi, but I'm going to sneak up on them by first thinking about projecting e pi to just the x variables or just the y variables. And we meet these very familiar spaces, matrix Schubert varieties and, uh, and their duals. Um, so uh, I had forgotten about a small break. Um, this is a great time. Thank you very much. Um, any questions before the break? Oh, sounds like there are no questions. So maybe we'll take a five minutes break. It's uh, 4.33 right now, 4.34. Uh, so maybe until 4.40, six minutes. Okay. And I will say um, uh, this claim made at the bottom is correct. Uh, you can find these slides online. So if you want to be able to jump around mm -hmm. um, independent of my jumping around, you'll be able to. <laughs> 